Merci. And so I'm going to share my screen and we can go live. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Donc, euh, bienvenue à ce premier webinaire de l'année euh, de Numana. Donc, quelle opportunité pour des quartiers intelligents, verts et empathiques. Good, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of, Wimana, of, uh, of Numana on uh, empathic neighborhoods. So, um, I'm Asma, I'm the, I'm the director of marketing of Numana, and uh, we let people a few minutes to join us uh, and uh, jump in on this webinar. Euh, c'est un webinaire euh, en anglais, donc, donc comme c'était mentionné euh, dans la description de, du webinaire. Euh, ceci dit, je fais une petite présentation de Numana en français, comme ça, ça vous donnera un petit peu euh, une idée pour ceux qui ne nous connaissent pas, de qui on est, etc. Puis après, on passera au webinaire qui est en anglais. La raison pour laquelle c'est en anglais, entre autres, c'est parce qu'on a avec nous euh, un conférencier qui est euh, finlandais. Donc, euh, le français a été un petit peu euh, hors de question. <rire> donc... Euh, pendant que les gens continuent à se joindre à nous, euh, euh, je vais euh, passer un petit peu sur le, le programme de ce webinaire. Donc, on va, je vais vous parler rapidement de Numana, qui on est, qu'est-ce qu'on fait, etc. Pourquoi euh, les bâtiments empathiques Donc, c'est un peu euh, un, un sujet euh, pas forcément très usuel. Donc, on vous expliquera pourquoi on s'intéresse chez Numana à ce sujet. Euh, et on passera au cœur du webinaire, donc euh, avec nos, nos chers panélistes, qu'on remercie d'ailleurs euh, vivement d'avoir accepté notre invitation et pour finir euh, le Q&A, euh, questions-réponses, donc euh, que je vous invite d'ailleurs tout au long du webinaire à mettre sur la, le, le chat, soit dans le chat, soit, soit dans la petite boîte à questions euh, du Zoom. Euh, euh, et on va les adresser à la fin du webinaire, donc restez avec nous jusqu'au bout. Euh, donc, euh, quelques mots sur Numana, a few words on Numana. So, Numana... Numana, c'est anciennement Techno Montréal, donc c'était et c'est toujours la grappe des technologies du Grand Montréal. Mais en 2020, notre scope s'est agrandi un tout petit peu pour devenir pan-québécois, parce qu'on avait vraiment beaucoup de demandes, beaucoup de, de projets un peu, peu au-delà de Montréal. Donc, et puis, notre modèle est passé de celui de grappe à une grappe un petit peu plus hybride, avec des activités aussi un peu plus think tank. Donc, je vous explique ça un petit peu plus un peu plus en détail. Euh, donc, euh, tout d'abord, il y a un peu le volet think tank à travers nos études et nos comités d'experts. Euh, et nous identifions et analysons les technologies de rupture et modèles d'affaires émergents et leur impact socio-économique. Donc, dans le fond, on produit des études tout au long de l'année, euh, accompagnées par cinq comités d'experts euh, qui sont aussi bien des membres de Numana, euh, entreprises en technologie, universités, etc., mais aussi des gens aux auxquels on fait appel, euh, qui ne sont pas forcément des membres de Numana. Euh, puis les sujets sont euh, donc bâtiments euh, et quartier empathique, d'où euh, l'intérêt pour le webinaire d'aujourd'hui. Euh, euh, quantique et spécifiquement euh, communication quantique. Euh, euh, tout ce qui est technologie pour le mieux vieillir et pour le maintien à domicile. Donc c'est une question très importante euh, au Québec et d'ailleurs partout à travers le monde. Euh, puis euh, numérique durable. Euh, et, euh, et donc il y a d'autres sujets que je vous invite d'ailleurs à regarder, à découvrir sur notre site web. Ensuite, on a aussi des projets structurants, donc euh, suite à des recommandations, soit des comités, soit de nos partenaires, bailleurs de fonds, euh, ministères, etc., ont euh, fait des projets un peu plus terrain. Euh, donc, notamment, un exemple que je peux vous donner, c'est le projet Cercle API, H donc plus ici. Donc, suite à la COVID, comme on le sait, il y a eu euh, un, un, plusieurs problèmes avec les commerçants qui n'étaient euh, qui pas forcément euh, très à jour sur euh, leur stratégie numérique. Donc, on a créé le projet Cercle API pour accélérer la transformation numérique des, des commerçants. Donc, à Montréal, Laval et Vaudreuil-Soulanges. Donc, c'est un projet qui a vraiment donné des super bons résultats. Puis, on a plusieurs projets comme ça. Euh, encore une fois, que je vous laisserai découvrir plus en détail euh, sur notre site. Puis, enfin, on a un troisième axe qu'on qu regarde plus comme un axe de favoriser vraiment un environnement euh, propice pour l'industrie des technologies qui touche au talent aux politiques publiques et au leadership conscient, notamment le programme Cercle, euh, Les Cercles Humains. Euh, donc, la quatrième cohorte se prépare pour cette année. Si vous êtes intéressé, n'hésitez surtout pas à nous contacter pour en parler. Donc, euh, voilà quelques chiffres, euh, juste pour vous donner quelques idées de, 
euh, ce qu'on fait. Et puis, comme je disais, n'hésitez pas à aller sur le site ou également à nous écrire. Euh, euh, tous les contacts de, de l'équipe sont sur le site de l'Humana. Si jamais vous voulez euh, en savoir un petit peu plus ou vous rapprocher de nous. Euh, puis, on passe à un autre sujet. Donc, euh, switching back to English, why empathic neighborhoods? Um, I think it's a topic that uh, definitely uh, has been a little bit of an underdog because we've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, smart cities and uh, smart buildings, but not necessarily on the scale of neighborhoods. So we thought to give it a go at Numana and, uh, you know, uh, uh, get a little uh, interested in it more and uh, open a discussion like the one we are doing today and more webinars uh, that are uh, that we're preparing for you guys and uh, that we're going to be sharing with you in the next weeks but also um, a research project. Uh, and on that, I'll let uh, my colleague uh, François Bédard uh, talk to you more about it. François is our lead on empathic uh, buildings and empathic neighborhoods at Numana. So François, uh, I'll let you uh, go on. Merci, As Merci Asma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, honestly, it's a great privilege to have this um, panel with us today. Um, and actually what is very amazing is Um, Numana decided to, through this think tank called Humanitech, go beyond only uh, uh, only uh, go beyond only about technologies. So basically, we we send we launch our first initiative in, in, in abatic buildings and abatic neighborhoods in I think December 2018 or something. So something happened between 2018 and and today. It's called a pandemic. And also from a workforce perspective and also for uh, work, uh, how, how can we build citizen services and basically be bold, be bold about what cities should do, what buildings should do. And that's why we come up with the concept of uh, apathetic neighborhoods with, the, with that knowledge, which is basically what Tommy uh, Tieko from Finland brought us um, in 2018. And also uh, Ursula Akers from, from Concordia was Part of that that things so it was very amazing but today there's so much fundamental happening and we expect more services by by the cities and how can we align technologies to understand behaviors perspective so that's the notion of so it's a mix of a lot of discipline um urbanisms energy management technologies safety public service So we try to make this as, as simple as possible. Um, I think empathic buildings and empathic neighborhood is the next thing, to be honest. I think Montreal is the one of the best sandbox to test those initiatives because one of the goal with Numana is to basically at the end of the of this year, come out with, with what we call la matrice of uh, empathic neighborhoods. So I'd like to present to you uh, the panelists and, and having basically a notion of what does it mean with different perspectives. So Tommy Tieko, um, Dr. Ursula Eikers, and also Dr. Marie Pibaro. So for your information, Tommy is in base in Finland, Ursula is based in Montreal, and, and Marie is based also in France. So I, can, I, I want to break the rules. So maybe you, you can introduce yourself as maybe 30 seconds or one minute. Tommy, Ursula, Marie, what's your background and what's your role exactly in, into your uh, organizations? Thank you. <clears throat> If I started, my, my name was first, so there, so, so yeah, my name is Tommy Teiko and greetings from Finland, yeah. I cannot say good morning because it's the evening here, but yeah, my, my history comes from the application development, so I have created 30 years of digital solutions, mostly consumer solutions for large corporations, and, and now I'm heading uh, a business unit Uh, in Finnish company uh, called Haltian and, and heading the business called Empathic Building, which creates a digital copy of the world and creates the best possible end user experience, what we call Empathic Build. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tami. Ursula? Yeah, good morning from, from Montreal. Um, Well, I joined Concordia two years ago and um, on this Canada Excellence Research Chair in Smart, Sustainable and Resilient Cities and Communities. And because it's such a mouthful, um, we worked on um, coming up with a new um, title the, and we called it Next Generation Cities. So it's we can discuss what the difference between this and empathic 
um, cities or neighborhoods is, but it goes exactly in the same direction, I would say. And um, in my chair, which is based in engineering, I look mainly at um, zero carbon solutions for cities. But in addition, um, I co-founded the Next Generation Cities Institute at Concordia, which combines um, 14 large research centers looking at, at all aspects of, of cities from design, arts, culture, community, over mobility and sharing and IoT services um, up to the built and natural environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Marie? Oui, bonjour. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to uh, you know all of you. So Marie, based in Paris. I'm the global head of research for JLL Work Dynamics. So this is side of our business, which uh, looks after occupiers, uh, and uh, you know our occupiers' clients are the main clients I interact with. Uh, I help them decode the future of work. This is where my core competence, uh, you know, is. Um, I help them understand how you know changes around work, the workforce, the workplace is impacting um, their portfolio, uh, you know, strategy, but also understanding. What are the workforce preferences at the moment, especially over the last 24 months? You can only imagine, you know, how busy we've been uh, uh, really embracing hybrid ways of working, embracing, uh, you know, remote working. So this is having quite a significant impact on the way our clients are looking at the future of their portfolio, the future of work. So we collaborate with uh, Numana. I'm going to be helping. Uh, uh, you know, the team to uh, develop the, the matrix on uh, empathic uh, neighborhood. Uh, and I'll make reference to specifically one project that I've been working on over the last uh, 24 months on the notion of responsible real estate. Thank you, Marie. Very interesting. Um, so for the benefits of the audience, we basically, uh, myself, Asma also, and, and the panelists, we basically um, nailed down some open questions and those questions are all be addressed to the panelists also, but the challenge is we know each other, we know that we are, we have so many things to share. So we will try to make it as, uh, as focused as possible because we only have one hour. And also we want to have also um, a portion at the end for a Q and A for the audience. So my first question would be for, uh, for Ursula. Um, how can we define an empathic neighborhood and what what could make a neighborhood sympathetic, uh, empathic? Um, what is the, what are the elements that we need to consider in advance? Well, I mean, you selected the picture. So if you look at that, um, it, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, empathic neighborhoods focus on the quality of life of the inhabitants and, and the type of relationships they can have in, in such a neighborhood. So it involves places to meet, um, access to green space. So here you chose a pretty green um, neighborhood. Um, but in addition to this, also resources to be shared with where we have a technology element because you need to know what resources are available, whether it's cars or tools or services that you can share it um, with your neighbors. So I think in uh, as a sort of broad definition, I mean, empathic neighborhoods um, try to create healthy, mixed, socially inclusive um, environments. Um, so, which is not all about technology solutions. Um, for example, the access to green space was a big topic in, in the pandemic, but also good air quality, healthy environments is, is very important to people. But there is a connection, of course, to the way we organize um, neighborhoods. So if you can basically walk or cycle to the main amenities, there will be less traffic, thus um, less air pollution. So, so there's always an interlinkage between, um, I would say, non-tech um, aspects, um, meeting places, public space design, um, green space access, and then um, technology solutions which facilitate um, access to services and, and usage. In addition, I think if you talk about these sort of walkable 15 minutes um, kind of neighborhood concepts, um, we, we also should think of um, zero carbon strategies. That's where cities need to go, zero waste um, strategies, again, where we need concepts for reuse, recycling, resource sharing. And then maybe as a 
as a concluding remark, um, places where there will be a combination of work, leisure, play um, in the same neighborhood, because that immediately impacts um, carbon efficiency um, because mobility um, will be, mobility um, emissions will be reduced in such impasic neighborhoods. Uh, thank you a lot, Ursula. Um, I think now the biggest challenge is we, there's some cities that there's some lands who are basically uh, pre-qualified. We already have some roads and buildings and stuff like this. So is it better to do into a, a clean land or something else? Because I think to redefine what a land should be from an apathic perspective, also we need to find about those new services that will support this apathic uh, taking care of uh, which is on, on the other side so i think the biggest challenge is what do we do with uh, pre-build uh, that the, uh, the actual infrastructure right now so what kind of uh, services we can do to go a little, bit, a little bit deeper but i'll go to the next questions because the topic is so large it's so vague so and the next question is what is the size or dimension of an apathic neighborhood is it a city or a district that goes with it and maybe uh tommy you can answer this from a, from a technology perspective and how wide, because we can talk about coverage and stuff like this. Basically, <clears throat> basically size doesn't matter nowadays anymore. You know, we are aware of that, what we, in, in a technology perspective, where we have uh, cheap as technology to get the data and, and enough computing power and endless amount of space to store data. So. So in, in, uh, in, from, from the technology perspective uh, and, and the real-time data perspective, now the size really doesn't matter. And, but a little bit to understand what empathic uh, concept means when we are talking about software and, and technology, I, I will try to explain it very, very, very like a shortly. Uh, some really intelligent people, they are still claiming that, that softwares and, and technical solutions really cannot understand how people feel. And, and this, this might be a, like a, one of the biggest problems of coming uh, artificial intelligence and, and this kind of machine, machine learning things. But I, I, I am challenging this thinking by bringing in actually one of the data source that quite many actually haven't thought about which is bio data. So, for example, I have this fabulous uh, in Finnish innovation called Oraring, uh, which is engineered by, by former Nokia, Nokia talents in, in Finland. And, and with these type of wearables, we can actually understand on the level of, of how people feel. So, Think about if future applications really could understand how I feel as a human, that would give us the level to understand and, and create services. One, one example is that our, our empathic building with, where we, our aim is to adjust the lighting and the indoor air quality and the whole surroundings of, of, of places where we work, where we eat and so on to adjust how we actually feel as a humans. So this is the correct concept, the technology concept behind empathic uh, technology solutions. So, so deepening the understanding with, for example, with biofeedback and, and real-time data analytics from face expressions and, and, and natural language processing and those to understand how we feel as a humans. That's, Thank that's you, the concept. And, and neighborhood or one building, size doesn't matter. Technology is here. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Tommy. Um, Maggie, I'd like you to react on that question because I think one of the first studies you did last year, and I was following you also uh, on, on, the, on the international level because you did an approach with uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, responsible buildings, building responsibilities and responsible cities. So have you managed to basically um, evaluate those dimensions of those uh, responsible projects with buildings and cities? So I'd like, to, I'd like to have a reaction because I think with the new dimension about Empathic, um, the notions of dimensions and neighborhood make more sense, but 
what have you learned from your last research and what is basically those those criteria of 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 the dimension that goes with it just a line about what you already did as an international research marie well, we discovered a lot as part of this uh, research on, uh, you know, responsible real estate. I mean, I think clearly we, we are entering a new age of responsibility and where social purpose and accountability for a resilient future are really driving the transformation we, we're witnessing at the moment. And empathic uh, neighborhood are part of this. Um, I mean, from my side, working with, uh, you know, occupiers and investors, we know that they are recognizing that buildings are becoming agents of change and a force for good, that we have a role to play. And those buildings are part of a, an overall ecosystem in relation to a community, to a city, to a public infrastructure. Uh, so we really need to think about uh, the partnership which is happening across all of those layers in order to drive more responsibility at the core of the solution that uh, you know we deliver so in a way we really need to translate those um, ambitions and sustainability targets into action and empathic and neighborhood are one of the response uh, tommy highlighted uh, uh, you know uh, another response through uh, you know technology and Ursula is, is really taking that at the, at the city level, you know, the next gen, uh, you know, city that we need to start to, to think about. So we've been looking at, you know, the, the, the spectrum of opportunities for real estate to help drive more uh, responsibility. And when I talk about responsibility, it's really about all the actors and, and partners adopting a, a, a responsible behavior and, and approach and also an investment model uh, to create an environment which meets people's expectation and preferences, but also go beyond those expectation and preferences by creating a community life in harmony with the environment. And that's where it becomes very difficult, is how you, you bring it all together. So when we talk about responsibility, we talk about, of course, the environmental topic of you know eco healing um, and uh, and creating uh, you know net zero solution. I mean I'm I'm generalizing you know the the topic of environment, but you know what I mean the sustainability angle. But we also talk about the human angle, um, uh, the notion of inclusiveness, uh, which uh, you know real estate can deliver. Um, how how we need to become much more authentic in the solution that we deliver. So that connection with the local community is super important. How we augment uh, also solutions through technology. I mean, that's a topic of, uh, you know, of Tommy and how we'll build a uh, resilience in, in the long term. So it, it, it's all of this which come into play when we think about, about it. What I, what I found very, very interesting is the debate between citizen services and workforce citizens, uh, yeah. services. Um, so I'd like to have maybe an open discussion with the panelists. Is it more, should it be more a citizen services focus or more into a workforce uh, focus to develop those environments? Because at the end, as we know from a pandemic perspective, now teletravail becomes a de facto way to do, to work. Mm -hmm. But how can we Re-establish those neighborhood. So, how do we mix workforce motivation with 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 the employer that goes in the mm -hmm. back, and also from a citizen perspective? And or is it okay to mix everything? Because by thinking about what should be the criteria of this matrix that we are building, and also from a demographic perspective, older generations, mix of generations, younger, yeah. uh, middle age, and and senior, is it do we do we need to start as a workforce focus or a citizen or a mix of both? So I'm, I'm, I'm very keen I, to have a response. Yeah. I, if you think about the journey of someone going to a place, whatever place, a city, mm. somewhere else, the journey starts at home, somewhere which is your comfort zone. And there you are a citizen. So, you know, all your path towards a place of work, as an example, as a final destination, you are a citizen, you experience city, you experience the, the infrastructure which is provided 
uh, by the public sector, you or, or even the private sector, you 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 experience uh, community life before you enter a building, and then you step into a physical environment, which we call a workplace. So for me, I think the conversation needs to start with the human angle, the people angle, the citizen angle, uh, who become users, and from users that become a worker. Uh, that's how I would look at it, uh, Francois. I don't know if uh, uh, maybe Ursula, you, you have a, a different point of view on that, but that's how I imagine it. That journey, you started as a citizen, as an individual with uh, private needs, um, which you transport within uh, an, an, a space that you share um, with others, and then you become a, um, you know, a worker or you are a consumer, not only a worker, you could be also something else, you could be consuming that environment differently. Interesting. Ursula, would you like to react also? Because I think what we, 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 we exchange is, okay, now we need to do it. Now we need to, to build it. Now we need to plan it. All the technologies, all the solutions exist. There's grants also. So how can we move forward? So I'd like to have your reaction also, uh, Ursula, on this. Is it more a workforce approach or a citizens or both? What, how do we start as step one, you know? I, I mean, of course, it's both because we're never separate entities. But I, I want to maybe point out the, the, the role of the commute because, I mean, why did people like to, to live, to work at home? not because they like to work at the kitchen table or in, in some cramped spaces with children playing, but because they could avoid commutes, long commutes. And I think that's one of the central um, issues that uh, we separated um, workspaces down in downtown areas from, from places that people can afford to live, which is often the suburbs, um, so, so far that the commute becomes a real issue for, for your quality of life. And that's, I think that's the main reason why people um, like um, teleworking and, and not because they like to work at home. Because I think the workplace has still a fundamental role to, to play in, in making connections between people. And of course, um, the surroundings of the workplace also give plenty of opportunities to socialize. But I think the, we, we really need to, to, to rethink um, the location of these different um, usages of, of buildings. And I think it's happening because, I mean, the downtown cores are pretty heavily hit by the pandemic. So some are getting converted in, into residential spaces and in, in more um, suburban places, there is a, um, a move to increase density, especially around the transit hubs. And that offers again a, a new opportunity to combine and bring closer together work and um, living um, spaces. And I think that's crucial for, for quality of life. So I think we need to move back to a more polycentric idea of a city where, where functions are mixed and um, where we avoid this sort of incredible waste of time and uh, not to speak of emissions and, and all the environmental aspects of, of commuting. That's that's something that became pretty clear in, in the pandemic that nobody likes to waste time being stuck in, in traffic on, on the road. So yeah, it, no, it needs to be addressed at the same time because it's very interrelated. And I, and I think the, the next question, sorry, Tommy, the next question makes so much sense because who are the key stakeholders who can play a role in making a neighborhood empathics? Mm -hmm. Because this is not only a real estate mindset alone. Um, municipal, uh, les élus municipales has a role to play. So who are the key stakeholders who can play a role in making this neighborhood uh, empathic? Maybe as you can you can add and tell me you can complete on, on that topic. I mean, it's not, not an easy question. I mean, the, the citizen, the picture you show there, of course, can take initiative, not just on how they use spaces or whether they do urban gardening or urban farming, but maybe also more active in, in transforming their neighborhoods um, in um, more livable spaces and at the same time, maybe retrofitting their buildings or doing actions of making, making the, their own environment more livable. But of course, you also need um, people who, who bring in the investment. If you, if you want to improve um, the building stock, 
or if you want to uh, change the street layout, you of course need the um, municipality and you need the real estate and, and the banks and financing models to make it happen because that cannot all be on the shoulders of, of individual citizens. Mm. Tommy, would you like to react? Who are the, the, key, the key stakeholders? Uh, I, I think it all, everything comes for the design. Uh, because when, when I started my career to create applications, it was a clear that you spent, it, it was this kind of waterfall way of, of, of doing things. So that you, you spent two, two years to, to do the design, three years to develop, and then 20 years in India to, <laughs> to manage or, or maintain this kind of application. But nowadays we don't do software like that. So could this same thinking, I had this kind of concept thinking about the, the minimum viable building. So could it be some kind of minimum viable neighborhood where you actually don't so much spend upfront time for the design? I know this is very really hard from the city planning perspective because we all know that it's a it's a like a really long period of time of designing. So, but I would take this kind of bold approach. To, to invite people to live in this kind of minimum viable neighborhood and then collecting the data and based on the what we call feedback loop, would that be a, like a solution to select the stakeholders who can actually create this kind of ecosystem of, of companies and, and services to this neighborhood? That would be my approach. But I know that there is so many rules and regulations that might might try to do the best to to, to stop this type of approach. <laughs> For sure, uh, Mary, I'd like to have your reaction because let, let's let's project ourselves saying, okay, someone is asking, I want to build a Napatic neighborhood. How do we start? Who should be at the first dinner talking about how do we do? Who should lead? Is it? The private sectors? Is it the public sectors? Who should be sitting at this first dinner to evaluate who should lead and why? And at the end, I'm, I'm joking with, uh, with this. Sometimes I'm coaching leaders that are still stuck in 1980s and the other one are stuck in 2030s because nothing is happening so fast. It needs to happen faster. But this kind of a 50 years of dilemma, we learned something. Uh, we hit the pandemic, we need to do better, but we're stuck into old stuff. Mm. It's, it's policies, it's rule. It's not even about money, okay? Capacities exist, everything, but back to, and, and maybe okay. wear your hats as advisor, corporate research, capital market, uh, owners and everything, and, and the business model goes with it. Who should be sitting at this first dinner saying, okay, we want an opatic neighborhood. Who should start, you know? Okay, the French person first, Francois, the first person you should invite is a chef and a sommelier. Yeah. <laughs> so you get good food and good wine. Okay, yeah, that's sure. the basic. That's the basic at a dinner for us. But more seriously, I think you should have both public and private, you know, parties. And that's, and, and, and I don't like, I, I really don't like the word public and private, <laughs> personally. Mm. I think they are actors into the ecosystem to create a final product, which is going to meet the demand of the users. So call them owners, investors, builders, humans, citizens, city representatives, um, community representative, um, I think we should have a selection of people who are going to contribute to the project uh, to deliver what is best for that specific uh, you know, neighborhood. Um, but not everybody will be able to contribute at the same level, okay? Today, we, we have a big dilemma uh, which I think Ursula, you, you spoke about it at the beginning, and also you, uh, you know, Francois, is the fact that a lot of the spaces we're going to be in in 30 years' time is already built. Okay, mm. we're starting to see that some cities are calling for um, a, a stop to new uh, planning, uh, you know, permission, and pushing for uh, only retrofitting. So doing 
what we already have, you know, in place and improving, you know, the current, uh, you know, uh, your current stock, stock basically of, uh, of places uh, that we have into, uh, you know, city and suburban, uh, you know, area. So uh, we're going to be faced with a different um, opportunity, which is the opportunity to build mm. on something which is not as robust as we would like it to be. Uh, mm. But it's a reality of, uh, you know, of the situation. So having having actors which can represent what is the actual life within this neighborhood first, and actors who can help to take it to the next level, like Tommy, like Ursula, um, and actors who can make it happen, both physically and also financially, because it does require, you know, at some point a financial, you know, investment. I think all that for me, the I would say the three calls of, uh, people who need to sit around the, you know, around the table and start the conversation. But, you know, we, we often into situation, uh, you know, through, through our, our work at, at JLR, where we work with clients to uh, develop um, new neighborhood from scratch, okay? I'm thinking about a bank outside of Washington, which was given a big piece of land to actually create a mini city uh, and they're still building the city after, you know, 10 years. Uh, and they still, they continuously, I would say, improve uh, the neighborhood um, by investing into, um, you know, the, the local life itself. And it goes beyond just creating, creating places of work, a parking slot. Uh, you know, they invest into building schools, cinema, health centers, uh, health facilities, uh, retail, you know, uh, uh, centers everywhere. So they, they they recreate, you know, a life. My experience of this, and I've been on, on this side, is that it's okay, but it's not fantastic. Um, I think what is really important, and that's something we highlighted as part of the responsible real estate framework, is that you really need to build on the heritage of a, of a space, on that authenticity of this place and the authenticity of the people who live within this neighborhood to make it a true place to work. And I think that's something which we're going to be faced with in, in the future, is, is building something which is in harmony with what already exists and not trying to take too much of a major step, which may look from Bryant very innovative, but which is not actually meeting the, the, the local needs and the long-term uh, future of this environment because we we have cities for I mean certainly in the case of uh, of Europe uh, it's slightly different uh, you know in America but in Europe we we have cities who are centuries old and we still breathe this heritage we still respect this heritage so for me that that's important so not sure I've answered your question but uh, um, but, but yes, I, th I think, yeah, Marie, you nailed, it, you nailed it down. It's like it's a new dialogue. It's a new way to be sitting at the same table with a sommelier. We can pour wine <laughs> to all the guests to understand those motivations to do good, to do, uh, to do fundamental change. And, and one of the questions that I have also now for Ursula is, <laughs> I have a sous question because I'm thinking about uh, a sous, uh, uh, another question that goes with it. So Ursula, do you have an example? Uh, thank you for the example, Marie, that makes so much sense. Do you have an example of empathic neighborhoods around the world that really stand out or make a difference? And I, I have a sub question according to this. Does this empathic neighborhood will exist into the metaverse because it's like only 3D and digital twins? Or is it applicable tomorrow into a land by mm -hmm. bridging physical, digital, and the tools become a way to understand behaviors and data play. So, Yossi, do you have any example of an empathic neighborhoods around the world who basically stand out and make a difference as a, as a way to be inspired to do better and to do fantastic versus only good, according to what Marie just shared with us? Um, well, I mean, the examples that, that are well known for example, Vauban near Freiburg in, in, in Germany, or um, Hammerby near Stockholm, or, I mean, most of these neighborhoods are, are these really ecological um, neighborhoods 
basically new constructed or built on existing grounds, but where not much of the old stock was, was left. And, and they are characterized by um, basically no cars in the neighborhoods, sort of ecological materials, um, solar energy everywhere, um, places to meet. So a really um, young family setting. Um, but I, I don't find them, I mean, they're, they're good and interesting and they show what, what can be done. But um, they don't really solve the problem in existing cities. And I, I totally agree that the focus should be on existing neighborhoods and, and not a reconstruction um, of, of, of our cities. That is, not, that is not the most ecological way to go anyway, because it will require a lot of um, embedded carbon for, for new materials. So we should really work on the existing um, neighborhoods and, and make them um, more sustainable rather than going for these sort of very unique um, new constructions where you can get things um, right from, from the start. But um, th that's not really scalable because we need to come up with concepts in, in the existing built environment. And I think it's very feasible because as I said, if we, if we, bring, um, if we bring usages, I mean, work and, um, and living um, closer together again, um, we, we will solve a lot of these uh, mobility related problems that we have today and that really destroy much of our um, quality of life in, in, in our cities. Um, I think that, I mean, we just need to push out the, this incredible role of cars in our city um, in, in the next decades. And, and many cities are going that way using very different strategies. Um, and then we have a sort of livable um, neighborhood where we can test. And I totally agree with Tommy, I mean, go fast, prototype solutions, test which services work, and if they don't work, go for something else. So, and, and the pandemic has shown that it works. I mean, very flexible reuse of spaces, uh, convert stras, uh, um, streets into bike lanes or put allow much more restaurant terraces. So all these experiments, I think, um, should go on. And, and then we see what, what the people like, what gets accepted, where there's protest, of course, because there is protest if you take away parking. Um, but we need to experiment much more. And, and I think that that is probably going to be the future. And, and I don't think anybody has a solution how to make it happen. So these, these kind of um, table de consultation or these citizen or whatever we call them, round tables, neighborhood round tables that are proactive, that sort of bring people together with the explicit goal of creating um, projects in the neighborhood. I think we need to see much more of that. And we can't wait for one stakeholder to, to do it because it, it's not going to happen. So we, for me, it's, it's more a meta question. Who, who is uh, the facilitator to bring all these um, tables um, together? I think that, that's something we, I feel is very important to organize. And also on the same topic, because I think Montreal uh, did so much great work so far as to be recognized as a smart city to receive funding from uh, Infrastructure Canada and all those things. So, but, the, but, but now the big question is, why should the discussion and action it need to go beyond, beyond smart cities and covered neighborhoods as well? So why it should go beyond um, smart cities today? I mean, the smart city topic was, was uh, discovered a very, very small portion of, of the whole problem, I would say. I mean, if you look at smart city uh, actions in cities, it's mostly smart street lighting, or in Montreal, it was around um, food access or, or improving mobility interconnection. So it's, it's very, those are very particular projects that are important, of course, but they, they don't look at a neighborhood in its entirety with all the interactions that we want. Mm -hmm. So I think it needs to be a much more integrated approach on a, on a local level. And I think actually spatial scale does matter because I, of course, not in, in terms of data and data management, but in terms of getting people together and wanting to do something. Um, I think there it's, it's much easier on a, on a smaller scale than trying to do something for the entire city, which is it's mm -hmm. an incredible undertaking. Mm -hmm. And and maybe uh, from a technology perspective, um, tell me, I'd like you to react on this, why it needs to go beyond smart cities. As a founder of concept of empathic building, basically, what are your thoughts about this idea 
to go beyond smart city, but also the, fun, the fundamental of Empathix neighborhood that goes with it. Mm. Actually, my answer is, is even, even too straightforward, but uh, like already teased in the beginning, size actually doesn't matter. If, if we manage to create uh, empathic building where the services, indoor air quality, everything is adjusted based on the real understanding of how people feel the environment why we why would we not be able to scale that into the neighborhood or even city or even country level if we really 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 would really, really want to do so but but i think we have exactly the same showstoppers and problems with, with our existing built environments that we have faced now with with empathic building now trying to make buildings more more digital and more more human centric is that actually the history and the ownership models and and how we build buildings how we own them and how built environment is mostly as a investment portfolio and and and, and this kind of which is quite far away from the actual uh, everyday life of the actual end users which i think all the neighborhoods and cities and the buildings are built for i there is no point to have city if there is no humans <laughs> am i right so uh, what i have now experienced with, with empathic building is that that uh, that it takes so much time from the like rules and regulations and, and city planning perspective to be more flexible i think we humans we, we can already be more flexible how we were, where we were, how we community. You know, when COVID came and everybody went remote, uh, it took only a few days. So I'm challenging the whole real estate industry. If you want to make more empathic neighborhoods, you need to change as an industry. The whole mindset and, and everything must be adjusted accordingly and, and think this kind of change uh, with the with the open mind kind of approach and and it's a human and technology can help that because we have a uh, natural language processing we have a powerful tools that can for example understand and uh, real-time feedback so if decision makers on city level or neighborhood level are afraid of asking every citizen how they feel about the environment in every hour, it's not a technology problem anymore because you can actually process that amount of data real time nowadays without any problems. So, so basically that would be the correct correct approach uh, to, to go into the neighborhood level. But I must say that let's let's do it now on the building level massively. We have we have implementations in 20 countries now and we are growing, reaching soon to the one million square meter level of empathic buildings. So so slowly going there. So so let's see what would be the next step to the neighborhood level. Tommy, thank, Tommy, thank you. Thank you a lot for, with the sensor. What I found very interesting, and back to that question, is you come up with this concept in 2018. I saw you on the stage at the at the Numani, uh, Humanitech event with Numana, talking about empathic buildings and empathic platforms. It makes so much sense. Good news today, in 2022, February, the big question is, what did we learn from what happened for the last two years, we, and then now we get kind of an era of post-pandemic after scissors. What do we learn? Have we learned something about our neighborhoods, our residencies, the tools? So what is the big lessons that we should apply that basically happened for the last two years, even from a health perspective, seniors and people in food management, um, some some neighborhoods basically from a procurement perspective didn't have any food or something and how do we manage seniors and all those things so the big question is what if what did we learn what is the big lessons because 
I want also to pursue with Mary after about the talent requirement to deploy those empathic neighborhoods. So today, what is the biggest lesson that we learned from the from the past two years into a post pandemic era? Tommy, this is for you. I think I think the biggest learnings, and I have witnessed that with my my real customers using using empathic building and now seeing the data that actually the humans matter. <laughs> you know, there is no point to have huge office with fancy coffee machines and everything if you don't have any humans there. You know, I think that's the biggest learning now that that that, that the uh, thanks for this kind of virus boost digitalization leap we did going fully remote and 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 using using we are all really good users of these digital tools nowadays. So the biggest learning was that actually we can learn super fast as a human if if there is enough uh, or or enough big push that we just have to do it. so so mm. that's the biggest learning that, that 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 the human can change the behavior and even mindset quite many of my co companies i was discussing before pandemic says that no in li our line of work we cannot share our workplaces but now this this discussion and this kind of mindset it disappeared in two years. <laughs> this is incredible. Also. Thank yeah. you, uh, thank you a lot, uh, Tommy. Maggie, this is for you now. In today's talent pool, for workforce but talent pool has the capacity to execute and plan and design. In today's talent pool, ready to face those challenges and to build the next generation's neighborhood. Do we have those talent pool? How can we scale? Do we need to move to do more training because it's going to be new tools also? So, what is your what is your vision about the the new requirement mm. for execution about this talent pool? And we'll have also two questions from the panelists uh, from from the audience after. But yeah, does so, the talent is ready to execute? I think the talent is ready. The point that Tommy raised is that you know we've experienced something absolutely phenomenal over the last twenty four months. People can learn fast. They can switch fast. This is not going to go away. And I think this is an excellent sign that we can actually challenge uh, users, citizens, humans in a much faster way than we were able to, uh, you know, before. Uh, so they can learn, you know, quickly. They will need to be uh, trained differently. I mean, you know, the search for specific talents to deliver the final solution. Um, we probably don't have all the talent in place and the, the, the most significant push will be how we use uh, you know, technology to enable the solution. And here there is, there is a talent gap. Um, but I strongly believe that the mindset of people has really um, um, switch into the right uh, you know, direction. Um, and as I say, the last 24 months were phenomenal in terms of learning. And, uh, and I'm also seeing the mindset of, uh, you know, occupiers, the client that I work with is also shifting extremely, uh, extremely fast. Now, they don't want to give up, of course, on, the, you know, their, their real estate. They want people to go back to offices. People want to return to offices. But the deal is different. What people want to find when they return is very different from what they left, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the beginning of the, you know, the pandemic. And I think that's what we need to reconcile, uh, making sure that uh, we deliver uh, places which are enhanced, um, which are meeting their, you know, their preferences, their aspiration in, in the long term. Uh, which are a step up from, uh, you know, what it was before. And the concept of empathic neighborhood is something which is going to be very, very appealing. And that's why we, we, we are starting now to look not only at, you know, a space being a physical location somewhere, but also the, 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 the space which is surrounding it. Okay? Mm. And that's why I was using early on that uh, example of a journey, a journey from your home, your living environment to the place where you work, you have to experience it very differently. And to unlock all of this, we need actually cities 
authorities, political <laughs> uh, systems to provide us opportunities for renewal. You know, if you don't have the cities unlocking the possibilities to open cycling paths, to reinforce their public uh, infrastructure, their public transport, to, to open space to develop uh, empathic, um, you know, environment, it is not going to work. It's not just a case of having the real estate world at the end building a beautiful, uh, uh, you know, environmental building into a green neighborhood. That's not the solution. It's, mm. it's everything which goes around it. So you see the spheres of influence are really, really broad. So that's why, you know, your first question on the dimension, there's no yep. limit. There's no limit. You can't just look at it as, uh, you know, something which has clear, you know, boundaries. Very interesting. Uh, Asma, this is for you now to close with two questions from the audience. Thank you, Marie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So basically we have a first question uh, from, um, Patrick, uh, sorry, I can't see the rest of your name, but the question is, how can we make or redesign an existing neighborhood in Patrick and keeping his authenticity, its authenticity without gentrification? So anyone who wants to uh, have a take on, on this one. <laughs> well, yeah, I can comment on it. It's a difficult question because, I mean, whenever you significantly improve a neighborhood normally the value of properties raise and I think um, it can't be left just to the market I mean I guess that's where we need um, rules and regulations of and, and the concept of what happens to that neighborhood and as I said most likely it will increase in attractiveness and so unless you have, a, have an idea of what what will happen to the to the rents or property prices um, and, and you make sure that you have a percentage of um, affordable housing in there and, and rent stabilization, um, the market will, of course, go for price increases. And then you, you will have gentrification that we've seen that in, in many um, redevelopments, especially in inner city locations like Hafen City, Hamburg. It's, it's, a, it's a good project, but of course, it's, it's for the rich and beautiful. I mean, um, I, they would like it if I say that. <laughs> But I mean, unless you have a, a, a clear um, a clear concept of, of how to keep the the mixed use and 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 regulate for it, um, which Montreal has done, but mainly for new developments, um, it I think there's it, there's no easy solution. So I think that's where the the public sector and and uh, and clear um, targets where a neighborhood should go, uh, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be regulated. Thank you. Excellent. Very interesting. Basically, we have slightly uh, similar questions from Joachim Lemieux. And Joachim, I know it answered uh, already your question, but uh, I, I would like to hear maybe Marie or Tommy on that, because I'm sure uh, Finland and France have also a bit of the same issues with the affordability of uh, um, interest in housing and how could we make basically if those empathic neighborhoods more socially inclusive and, and um, accessible to everyone. Yeah, I, I was I was talking earlier on about the political harm, uh, which is uh, you know into cities. Because if I take the example of uh, of, of Paris, uh, you you can't build today a new residential area without having at least twenty percent of social, uh, you know, residents as part of it. I'm not saying all of the investors are respecting it. I think some are paying not to respect it, but it should be enforced. Uh, I actually live into what is close to an empathic neighborhood here and uh, you know 20 percent of the building uh, uh, you know I'm in is is for uh, you know social uh, um, you know social purpose uh, you know we have actually a, a hospital just here <laughs> uh, you know close by you have a school so 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 it's and, and that is I would say the political pressure the planning pressure which is making it happen and, and, and that should, uh, should continue. Um, I think the call for um, um, improving um, uh, building and retrofitting facilities rather than building new one is an excellent uh, you know, call. Um, and we also need to uh, um, you know, get cities to, to invest into local life to make sure that uh, uh, things are available. I and mean, the concept of the 15 minute city is fantastic. 
Uh, I mean, this is one which is really going to help people to remain into uh, into cities, uh, you know, cities environment. So I think, you know, when we look in a way, and Francois, you may not like what I'm going to say, but maybe the word neighborhood in front, in front of empathic is too restricted. Um, we, we need to talk about empathic behaviors, empathic, you know, approach <laughs> at large scale, but not restricted to just a neighborhood. Um, and because neighborhood um, calls for physical boundaries. Um, and, and today what we want is actually no physical boundaries because physical boundaries bring social boundaries, uh, you know, drive, um, drive uh, separation uh, between communities. And, and it's something which you want to drive away. You want to have the inverse phenomenon. So I see you laughing, but we can- I'm laughing because before. Marie, <laughs> you, are, you are reading my mind, meaning that from a society perspective, yeah. I think we need to be more empathic first. Yeah. So, but after the tools could enabling to understand what's going on because there's a huge impact on workforce and change of jobs. Well, I was following numbers in the US. There's so many people that basically doesn't lost their job. They change the, their job. So mm -hmm. it's like a new thing. It's uh, There's precedent that makes so much sense. But I think <laughs> to your comment, and I agree, it's more a society value prior to a neighborhood and a region. But there's a mix that can go with it. And actually, I think people do, do not realize what is an apathetic neighborhood because they already live in it. I born, I basically had my three kids in my land because my land was, according to Montreal, this is the value. And I realized it was an apathetic neighborhood because we were supporting each other's. We had a second car, we split the cars with the neighbors, the kids were going at the same time. So I was living into this, but it was an old, uh, an old neighborhood, um, 1920s uh, factory bases, Ubisoft came in. But to your point, empathy is more a notions of society and how from a tools we can understand and enable, enable new services. So I like to wrap this up because I, why I'm doing this, because I think there's a notion of anthropology, sociology. It's not only about technology. Yes, it's very data centric because we need to understand what's going on. It's more than street lights. It's more than autonomous vehicle. Those things would happen anyway. But what should be the mix and who should be sitting at this first dinner and wine will be served to basically who should act first, you know, and make it relevant with action so i'd like to finish this thank you very much i think we have the same spirit to do goods at the end of the day uh, maybe asma you can close this one but thank you thank you very much panelists thank you uh, uh of the audience to be there and i know that uh, we have people from uh, the city of Montreal was listening i think we can learn more and, and from finland as well what uh, asma uh, we have some. We have also people coming uh, from Finland in the audience, so uh, cool. means that the conversation is international. Yeah, just just as a closing uh, note, um, thank you again uh, a lot to Marie Ursula Tommy for uh, accepting our invitation, and uh, for those who are still here with us, we're gonna uh, be soon releasing the next webinar, still on the same topic, but some probably more on something more specific like mo mobility or technology, et cetera. So to, deep, uh, to, to dive a little bit deeper into the topic. So thanks everybody. And uh, uh, we'll see you soon, uh, either on social media or uh, uh, virtually, or maybe physically if uh, things allow soon. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Be safe. Okay. Bye. 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 Merci. Bye. Bye.